Here today we're talking about growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And today we're talking about growing in the grace of God's Word. In 1982, uh, my wife and I and uh, 22 other ministers from North America were invited to go to the Soviet Union when Leonid Brezhnev was the prime minister there. We were invited to come and preach for two weeks prior to the coming of Billy Graham's first crusade. We were assigned different cities in that uh, Soviet Union to preach in different churches. And as we went into the Soviet Union uh, at uh, uh, the customs, uh, they took away my Bible, and I asked the uh, people who were taking it, why did you take away my Bible? They said, it's nothing but a bunch of myths anyway. And I said, well, it's a bunch of myths. You shouldn't worry about it. Why don't you just let me have it? I have my sermons in there. I need to take those with me. As we traveled throughout that country, we would go to the churches and meet with the people, and the ones who had Bibles would bring their Bibles out wrapped in cloths or wrapped in paper. And they would unwrap them. And before they opened them, they would always kiss them. And then they would sit down and open them. The Bible was precious. It was rare in those days. People could be put into prison for having a Bible if the authorities decided that's what they wanted to do. If a person was found printing material that related to the Bible, they could be put into a gulag there to disappear. And so the Bible was a, a very precious thing to them. Well, when Paul was preparing to leave the Ephesian church, a new church just established, he said to them in Acts chapter 20 and verse 32, Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace. The Greek writers use a word there meaning I place you over with it. I put you there with it. I, I leave you with, the, the, with God's word, with the grace of God's word. Now, Paul probably wouldn't see them again. He wasn't going to be there as a teacher. And so he said, I commit you to God and to the word of his grace. And then he says what that grace, that word can do, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I, I take you and place you over against the word of God's grace. And the word of God's grace is powerful enough that it can build you up, can help you grow as a Christian, as a believer, and it can assure you that if you leave this earth, and when you do leave this earth, you have an inheritance. There is some place you're going, something you're going to inherit. When we look at this Bible, we call it the Word of God's grace. It's called a holy Bible. If you own one, you see on the spine the word holy and the word Bible. Holy just means separate or apart. It was a Greek word, hagias, which means it's different. It's separate. It's apart. And Bible, biblos, means it's a book. The writings inside the book here are called uh, graphe, are writing scripture. We, we refer to them as scripture from the Latin word scriptura. So we have this Bible, which is different from any other book, a book different from any other. It is our Scripture. And for Western Christianity, for us as Christians, we have 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament. We call that our Holy Bible, our different book, our Scriptures. Uh, the Western Catholic Church has what's called the Douay Reims Bible. If you're raised Catholic, your official Bible was a do a Reims Bible, and that Bible had the apocryphal writings in it. There were 12 or 13 other books included in the 16th century, those books being written between the writing of the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, and the first book of the New Testament, Matthew. They contained the history of what happened in those 400 years. But the church, primarily the Western church outside the Catholic church, did not include these in what we call our Scripture. So we have, when we talk about God's Word today, we have 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, established in 90 A.D. by the council at Jamnia, a group of Jewish scholars who said these are the books that come from God, these 39. Not others, but these. And then about the 4th century, a bishop named Athanasius, writing an Easter letter to his congregation, said these 27 books we use as a New Testament. And so was established the 66 books that we have today. So when Paul speaks of that word of God's grace, what was he talking about? Paul didn't have the 27 books of the New Testament. He didn't even have the 39 books of the Old Testament all put together yet. That was not until 90 AD. He's writing somewhere around 40 or 50 AD. So what's he talking about here? Well, Paul has 
being a Pharisee, he has knowledge of the Tanakh, the primary first five books of the Old Testament we call Old Testament. Jewish people refer to as their Bible. He had that. He had the writings. Uh, he had some of the prophets, and he used those as God's Word. But Paul also was preaching God's Word and writing God's Word. So when Paul speaks of committing someone to the Word of God's grace in the first century, he was speaking of setting them down over against what had already been written about God and how God lives and operates in the world in which we live. Plus, how God was revealing himself to Paul and other writers in the New Testament. I'll talk about that a little more in a few moments. Did Paul know he was writing Scripture? Paul never indicates that he knew he was writing Scripture on par with the Old Testament. However, Peter later on will say, yes, he did. He wrote Scripture. And when the New Testament church was deciding on what would be Scripture, Paul would write most of the books of the New Testament, 13, perhaps 14, if he wrote the book of Hebrews. So when Paul was speaking of putting people over against the grace of God's Word here, he was speaking of the Word that was already spoken, already been spoken and recorded by the prophets, and the Word being spoken and recorded in his day. The writings, the revelation that he was getting from God. He says, I commit you to God and to the Word of His grace. I place you over against it. I deposit you with it. I'll not be here. You'll not have me as a teacher, but you will have the Word of God's grace as a teacher. The Word of God's grace functions that way. It's the teacher from eternity. So what is the Word of God's grace? What Bible did Jesus use when he was on the earth? Well, he used what they had in the first century, the Tanakh primarily. He used the scrolls. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 19, that Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, which we would say uh, would be a Saturday for us, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written. That was the Bible of Jesus' day. People didn't have it in their homes. It was kept in the synagogue. And he went there, and they invited him to read. He stood up, and he read it. That was his Bible. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus said, Do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. He didn't come to do away with what we consider to be Old Covenant or Old Testament. I've not come to abolish them, he said, but to fulfill fill them. So how did Jesus understand the word of God's grace? Well, in Luke chapter 4, 20 through 21, it says he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The word of God's grace is becoming Reveal, fulfilled, right here in your presence. And when he taught the Sermon on the Mount, he would say, Matthew 5, 21, 22, through that chapter, you've heard it, said, it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you. So Jesus took those writings of God's grace, and he said, this is what you read, but this is what I say to you. Go beyond the law. Go to the spirit of what God's grace is saying through his word. So Jesus understood the word of God's grace to be what had already been revealed before he was born, and now what was being unveiled or revealed in his life. For you've read, but I say to you, this is the way you ought to look at it today. Sometimes we have difficulty with what we call the Old Testament, because of the violence that we find there in the Old Testament, God's saying to people, go in and take those people's land. They're just farmers. They're having a nice time. They're raising their families and their animals. You just go in there and kill all of them. Tell them God said, come do this to you. They'll love you for that, won't they? Just tell them, go in there and take their land. People say, how do you, how do you reconcile that? A lot of books being written today on how do you reconcile God and the violence of the Old Testament. Jesus said, you've read this, but this is what I say to you. 
This is how it's being fulfilled, and now you've read it, and here you see it, and it's going to be written again. For Paul in the first century, this is how he looked at the word of God's grace. He said, in, or Peter said, considered Paul's writing scripture in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 through 16. Peter said, bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom God gave him. With the wisdom God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand. He must have been familiar with Romans 9, 10, and 11, hard to understand. Which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do the other scriptures. You see, Peter takes Paul's writings and says, they're right in there with all the other scriptures. The word of God's grace. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 through 21, this is how Peter understood it in the first century. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. God didn't just sit down and, and find an animal bone and start scratching out a word on it. That's not how it worked. When we were in Israel recently, we looked at the Dead Sea Scrolls, and some of you have seen them here in the States. But we looked at those Dead Sea Scrolls, and we looked at where they were found in those caves by a Bedouin shepherd boy looking for a little sheep. We saw that they made those, they wrote on those scrolls, on those pieces of parchment, and they stored them there so that we could have them today. But Peter says none of that came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy, that is preaching of God's word, never had its origin in the human will. That's what makes the Scripture so unique. The Word of God's grace, the gift of God to us, His Word, His mind. Not man's mind, but His mind. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, through, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Those Russian people who did have a Bible understood that to be the actual words of God spoken through people who wrote them for, for us to read. 2 Peter 3, 2, Peter says, I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. The words spoken in the past, the words now given through your apostles. How could we decide that there are only 66 books in our Bible. You know, today there's a Princeton scholar named Elaine Pagels. She's a very bright young lady. She's gotten a hold of what's called the Nag Hammadi Scrolls, some scrolls uh, discovered in Egypt in a library in the 40s. And uh, she's pulled out the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, the, uh, the Revelation of Peter, some spurious books which were not included in the New Testament by the early church. And she said, these are books... Uh, that were written that should have been included. She talks about the Gospel of Peter. She said uh, that should have been included. She talks about the Gospel of Thomas. She said the Gospel of Thomas should be included. Uh, John didn't like Thomas, she said. John was an early church leader, so, hey, he squashed Thomas' book. He wouldn't let it go in the Bible. Well, that's not quite true. The church fathers took a look at all these scriptures, and they said, first of all, were they written by an eyewitness, somebody who was with Jesus uh, were they written by somebody who was close to an eyewitness? Are they read in the churches regularly? And do they have an effect on people's lives? Now, that's what Paul's going to talk about here. You can have a, a magazine that can be absolutely correct, perfectly written, inerrant, but it won't have the same effect as the Word of God. So Paul's talking here about leaving people with the Word of God. And he says... It will build you up. Acts 20, 32, which can build you up. Scriptures have the ability or the power to build one up. Same word used here that's used in one, Acts 1, 8. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power and become witnesses of all that I've done. Same word used here. Paul says it has the power to build you up. Scripture is, was never written to tear people apart or tear people down. 
if Scripture is being read and understood as it should be, it is always to strengthen and build one up. Now, you and I have an opportunity of reading and hearing lots of uh, informational pieces about all kinds of different things. Much of what we read today is not designed to build us up. It's designed to uh, frighten us. It's designed to discourage us. But it's not designed to build us up. The writings of the Old and New Testament were given by God that we might be built up and strengthened. So when Paul says, I'm leaving you here, he reminds them that the word of God's grace in the absence of any human teacher has the power to build a person up. Just an individual sitting before the word and reading God's word can be built up. And so even though that church was surrounded by heathen superstition with very little knowledge and no apostolic teacher, they were alone to battle all the evils that they faced just like we do oftentimes. And he reminds them that God's, the word of God's grace is with them, and that is enough for them to be built up. Now, how does it do that? How does this word build us up? I love the Bible. I, when I was a, a fifth-grade student, uh, the Gideons still had permission to bring New Testaments to the schools. You remember those days? Some of you are ancient enough to remember the days when the Gideons would bring you a New Testament. And I remember getting that Gideon New Testament, and a friend of mine and I raced each other to see who could read through it first. And I carried it with me all through high school. I would carry it in my back pocket of my jeans. And I would read it before I'd go to football practice saying, Dear God, please help me not to get killed today. I'm going to read the promise. I want to be built up. I loved the Bible. It gives us, how does it build us up? It gives us confidence. It gives us confidence. It is the word of God's grace. Jesus was the word of God's grace made flesh. John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That's Jesus. Jesus reinforced the importance of the word of God's grace. In Matthew 4, 4, when he was battling Satan... And Satan was trying to co-opt his ministry, Jesus' ministry. Jesus said to him, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so we believe that the 66 books we have here, the scripture, that the writings here, actually are God's word. The disciples expressed great confidence in the word of God's grace. Acts 4, 31, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Now, they were afraid of being arrested, but instead of being afraid of being arrested, they were confident in the word of God's grace and spoke it boldly. Peter reinforced the word of God's grace. I've already read this scripture. I'll read it again. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets through human Though human spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the scriptures give us confidence. You worry about the world, you worry about nations and their alignments and, and uh, problems we find in the world, you worry about the economy, uh, you worry about uh, the IRS spying on you, uh, you worry about all these things you hear today. The world is designed to do that to you. To have you worry about it. The scriptures are designed to give you confidence. God is still in charge of this world. Every bit of it, and your life and my life. It gives us energy. How does it build us up? It gives us energy. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and active. You're not going to pick up any other book like this book anywhere in the world. No other book has a testimony of being alive and active. And so this is what the writer of Hebrews was saying. Sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. It is alive and active. 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul wrote, All Scripture, all Scripture is God-breathed. 
Theonoustos, the breath of God. God breathed into man the breath of life, and man became a living being or a living soul. You see that the precious nature of breath, we no longer have breath, we no longer have life. And so God breathed into man the breath of life. Here Paul says God breathed Scripture out of himself. It has the life of God in it, the life which is eternal. So it gives us that energy. When I'm reading Scripture, I'm literally taking in and breathing out the breath of the eternal. Isn't that amazing? I'm being, I'm being breathed into and I'm breathing out the breath of the eternal. It gives us personal spiritual tools. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scriptures God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. I love books. I read lots of books. I read books every week. No book is as useful in equipping me to live my life and do ministry as is scripture. It is the ultimate, the ultimate in equipping us to do the work God has given us. It gives us personal spiritual strength. Jeremiah 23, 29 says, Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? Matthew 7, 24 through 27, Jesus says, Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Now, that's what Scripture is. It, it gives us personal spiritual strength. The Word of God's grace builds us up with more and better knowledge of God and of Christ. So Paul says, I'm going to take you, I'm leaving you, and what I'm going to do is set you down over here with the word of God's grace. And even though I'm not here, leaders come and leaders go. Even though I'm not here and you don't have someone here who's an apostle, you have the word of God's grace. It's going to build you up and it's going to give you an inheritance. Now, what is the inheritance he's talking about? Well, here it is a gift of the word of grace a gift of the Word of grace. God's Word is the divine or the eternal testimony or testament in which we believers are named as heirs to whom the inheritance is conveyed. We were to go to a court of law to settle an estate. There would be a testament there. There'd be a document there that would be willing us certain things. When we were preparing to go to Israel, I had written everything very carefully, all the, uh, the uh, account numbers, bank numbers, insurance, all that, the house and all that uh, for two of my girls. Uh, one went with us, two were here. And uh, I said, all the, all the material's here, and, and if something happens to us, y'all are really going to be well off, really well off. And my youngest daughter said uh, when we got back, oh, somebody else is living in the house. I, meant you, I thought you meant go ahead and sell it. Uh, inheritance. We see the document. It says, that's ours. Our parents said, that's ours. I signed it. God it notarized. Everything's ready. If I were to go out tomorrow, everything's ready or today. Paul says that's what the Word of God's grace is. It's a testament given by God that you have an inheritance. Some days you're going to wake up feeling like you don't. There are probably times when you're going to behave in such a way you feel like you probably should be disinherited, right? So you get up thinking, maybe I'm not going to make it. Well, where do you turn to be certain you are going to make it? To the Word of God's grace. The word grace means gift. It is God's gift to us, and it's been passed on to us through the centuries. Paul says among those who have been sanctified, those who've been made holy and are still holy being set apart to Christ. The writer of Hebrews would say it this way. Hebrews 12, 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, who are those witnesses? People who have already gained the inheritance. 
Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. We know we're going to be with those who have professed faith in Jesus Christ. Can you imagine that? Nick Vaughn, one of our wonderful members, went to be with the Lord early yesterday morning. He used to sit right down here at the front, right behind Alan Walton here. And uh, he went on to be with the Lord 90 years of age. He knew where he was going. He knew it was time to go. He said to his wife, it's over and out. I'm ready to go. He knew that he had an inheritance. How did he know that? Because God had conveyed it to him through his word. And God, who cannot lie, promised that inheritance. The word of God's grace guarantee that saves us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Peter writes, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. That inheritance kept in heaven for you. Colossians 1, 12 through 14, Paul writes, In giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you, how do you do that? By the acceptance of Christ, who's qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. Or again, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Paul writes, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. That's what Paul's talking about. He's saying to these people that he's leaving behind, don't you worry one bit about that inheritance. It's guaranteed to you. Through what? Through Jesus Christ and the word of God's grace. It's a gift to you. It's an encouragement to you. It's an encouragement to me. How do we get it? How do we get that inheritance? Well, the word of God's grace gives us the wisdom to be saved. How am I going to know that I know that I know? When I come to the very end and I'm breathing my last breath, how can I know that when I pass from this life, I pass into the presence of God? 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 19, Paul writes, All this is from God who reconciled himself, uh, us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself, how? In Christ, not counting people's sins against them. When you accept Jesus Christ, you accept and receive God's gift of forgiveness from all the sins you've ever committed, are committing, will commit. They died with Jesus Christ and were buried. 2 Timothy 3, 15, Paul writes to Timothy, And how from infancy you've known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Acts 14, 3, So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to perform signs and wonders. Confirming his message to save us. The word of God's grace gives us the power to be saved. Romans 1, 16 through 17. Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is what? Revealed. It's revealed and recorded and given to us as a gift, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written. The righteous will live by faith. See, that's the, that's the gospel of God's grace. That's what we possess. That's what's been left with us. That's what's been preserved for us and given to us. It's a gift. It's a gift. Whatever your conscience may tell you, whatever the world may tell you, God's grace, his word says that you're saved and you have an inheritance waiting for you. 
Toward the end of his life, Paul gave this testimony, Acts 20, 24. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of what? God's grace. That was, that's what makes the Christian faith so unique. We have been gifted by God with the salvation that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. We don't have to work for it. We don't have to earn it. We're not born into it because we're born at a certain level in society. We're given it as a gift to all who believe. That means a little child who comes and believes. That means a young adult who comes and believes. That even means a lady like was baptized here last week, 86 years of age, who came and believed because it's a gift of God's grace. When you leave here today, you're going to be hit with lots of different words and messages. And tomorrow, you'll be hit with lots of different words and messages. And most of what we hear is not very encouraging. So where should we turn? The Word of God's grace. The grace of God's Word. The Scriptures. And when we turn to that Word, and by faith accept that word. And Paul says, even without a teacher present, you can be built up and encouraged and assured of your inheritance. Let me encourage you to do a number of things this week. First of all, in what area of my life has the word of God's grace given me confidence this week? Some of you know that. You've turned to the Bible because you needed a helpful word, a confident word. Second, has the word of God's grace equipped me spiritually? How do you know what you're supposed to be doing? You know, getting saved is just part of it. Continuing to minister is the other part. Third, what part of the word of God's grace assures me that I have a spiritual inheritance? When I come to the end of life, do I come to the end of life with regret? Or do I come to the end of life with hope? Knowing that this is just part of it and a very small part. The rest is the inheritance. Let's pray together. Our fathers, we come to you in prayer. We thank you for the word of God's grace. Thank you that you gifted us with it. We don't have to be a special scholar of any kind to understand what you're saying to us. Thank you for breathing this into those who would write. Thank you for preserving it for us. Thank you for gifting it with us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.